On October 15, 1981, Herrick Stone was found in her home while her daughter was at school. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Somia Carmen Herrick Stone On October 15, 1981, a dreadful tragedy unfolded in the home of Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone, a 30-year-old single mother from Quebec. Someone found Sonia's body on the floor of a living room with her pantyhose around her neck. What went wrong that terrible day that Sonia died too soon? How did the killer get into her house, and what did she do to die so badly? Carmel by the Sea, which most people just call Carmel, is a lovely beach town in Monterey County, California. A lot of people love it because it is so pretty and calm. Carmel still feels like a small town, even though only about 4,000 people live there. People who lived along the coast in Carmel, California were calm and peaceful. They had no idea that their town would become the scary setting for Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone's case. She lived in many places while she was alive. The girl was born in 1951 to Anthony Hurricane and Stella Hurricane. The Canadian native Sonia was born there, but she chose to move to Carmel, California in the 1970s. In this pretty beach town, she began a new part of her life. Sonia took another big step in her life when she married Michael Stone. They had a girl together in 1976, but in the end they split up. On Thursday, October 15, 1981, Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone's four-year-old daughter went to school. She had no idea what would happen to her mom. From what the Farmer's Almanac says, Sonia saw a family member before going home after 10 a.m. Carolyn McBride, Sonia's close friend, did what she always does and stopped by her house around noon. She had no idea that the sight she found would always be following her. She died and her body was lying still on the living room floor in her house. That girl used to dress badly. Her shirt and jacket were pulled back in a way that did not look good. Someone tied dangerous pantyhose around her neck and choked her to death. Even more distressing was the fact that Sonia's dead body was lying among the things in her purse. As time went on, doubts and questions began to appear in that story. The investigation into the terrible death of Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone was a tough case. Because her bag was full, she thought someone might have stolen it. But the exact things that were taken from the house were still missing, which made it hard to solve the case. A little more was clear after the autopsy report came out. The results backed the scary theory that the police had come up with. Sonia had been hanging herself. Once the people working on the case knew what they had learned, they got chills. Other interesting things were found while the body was being looked at. Sonia's left ring fingernail was broken, and there were blood spots inside the piece. The presence of blood under her nail gave the police some hope as it suggested the possibility of obtaining additional DNA evidence. Unfortunately, the forensic tools at the time were not very good, making it hard to get this DNA proof and study it. The cops talked to everyone who knew Sonia and her neighbors after the horrible murder. As the pieces of the puzzle came together, some questions grew about the neighbor who lives across the street from Sonia's. Michael Glazebrook, who lived next door, became someone the cops needed to look into. At the time, Michael Scott Glazebrook was married and 25 years old. He had just moved into the neighborhood and was living in the house next door to Sonia's a few months before the terrible event. During these important talks, detectives saw that Glazebrook was tense and uncomfortable. They also saw a big scratch on his right cheek that was three to four inches high. This made their doubts even greater. As flaws in Glazebrook's story became clear, the puzzle pieces began to fit together. He first said he was at his dad's house when the murder took place. It became clear that Glazebrook was a college student and a builder at the time of the crime as the probe went on. Matthew Lahoro, who is the deputy district attorney for Monterey County, talked about how interesting it is that Sonia and Glazebrook are friends. Investigators did not know what could have driven Glazebrook to do such a horrible thing because they had never met or worked with each other before. Other people in Sonia's neighborhood and friends had a hard time connecting the victim to the person they thought did the crime. This made people even more curious about what happened in Carmel, California on that terrible day. They caught someone in Monterey County on December 18, 1981, two months after the awful murder of Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone. When this happened, 
Claysbrook was in Monterey County Jail on charges of killing Sonia without bail. Soon after that, he was set free without being told, and the newspaper said that he would not be charged. In December 1981, Dean Flippo, who was the assistant district attorney at the time, said that there was not enough evidence to charge Claysbrook. Since the district attorney's office changed, the agents had to wait. They made their case again when the new deputy district attorney took over. A warrant for Michael Glazebrook's arrest was sent to his new home in Pacific Grove, which is five to seven miles north of Carmel by the sea. The new deputy district attorney gave the order to arrest. After catching Glazebrook on July 23, 1982, the Pacific Grove police set his bail at $250,000. The government took over Glazebrook's case because he could not pay for one. A hearing began in August 1982. The defense asked for a smaller bail amount and made it clear that Glazebrook was not likely to run away because he had been the main suspect since December 1981 and had never been outside of Monterey County. They also said he was not a threat to the neighborhood. The judge agreed and lowered Glazebrook's bail from $250,000 to $50,000. In November 1982, four months after Glazebrook's second arrest and a year after Sonia's death, the first hearing started. At this meeting, the prosecutors had to take care of a lot of important business. They had to say what happened that killed Sonia, show that Glazebrook did it, and provide enough proof to establish probable cause. The standard of proof is not as high at a preliminary hearing as it is at a trial. The lawyer only needs to show probable cause at a preliminary hearing, not proof beyond a reasonable doubt while the case is in court. At the preliminary hearing, a serologist named Dr. Edward Blake told the judge that he had looked at the victim's blood and pee and found no signs of an attack. Coroner and top medical examiner Dr. Boyd Stevens, who is also an expert, said that he was good at putting together scenes of attack and that the bruises he saw on the victim were consistent with and proof of assault. A very important person to speak was Michelle Wilson, a friend of the suspected murderer. Wilson had already told the police that she talked to Glazebrook and that he promised to be at the victim's house on the day of the murder. Further, she said she saw scratches on Glazebrook's face, which he explained were from a fight at Monterey Peninsula College the day after the murder. Wilson changed her story in a way that no one saw coming when she went on the stand. She said she had forgotten some things about the talk because of the time that had passed. When she said she had never told detectives about the talk, they were shocked. The government then called an agent from the sheriff's office to talk about what Wilson had said before she changed her mind. Remember that as the trial went on and more evidence and studies came in, there were differences between what the witnesses said and what the detectives wrote down. It is possible that these mistakes have nothing to do with the case, but they make it harder to figure out what went on. Even with this setback, the judge still believed there was enough proof to charge Glazebrook and keep the case going. Someone asked the Monterey County Superior Court in February 1983 to drop all charges against Glazebrook because there was not enough proof. The judge who was in charge of the hearing made his decision based on the detailed record of the first hearing. He agreed with the first judge that there was likely enough proof to open the case. While the state tried to show Glazebrook's guilt, the judge did not think they could do it. There was another meeting in June 1983. It was this time the defense asked the judge to throw out Glazebrook's insulting words to the police. As asked, the judge agreed. It is possible that using these statements at a preliminary hearing would have helped prove probable cause. They dropped the charges against Glazebrook, though, because they could not use these words in court. Glazebrook was fired right away, though, because he was caught murdering someone again in July 1983. Now that it has been almost two years, Sonia's family and friends must be very upset about her arrest. A lot of people in Monterey County, including almost all of the judges, met and spoke out about the case. The family had a harder time dealing with their loss because of this. The new arrest meant that Glazebrook got a new preliminary hearing and a new public defender. Even though the meeting was short, only three days, there was a good reason to go to court. It looks like this new arrest was not based on any fresh evidence or information. To put it another way, the prosecutors would still have the same issues they had before. The prosecution had a lot of trouble because the comments Glazebrook gave to the police, which were illegally obtained during the investigation, were not used in the case. 
They actually caught Glazebrook on civil traffic warrants by homicide investigators instead of traffic cops. This was just a way to question him without charging him with murder. The judge said that the arrest was wrong and that any evidence or information gathered during the arrest could not be used in court. In November 1983, there was finally a court case. Early in the trial, the state asked a number of Sonia and Glazebrook's friends to testify. As of 10.15 a.m., they thought the murder happened, so they were looking for signs that Glazebrook was in the area at that time. Stone's body, on the other hand, was found at 12 p.m. The defense responded by showing different neighbor reports that Stone may have come home closer to 11 a.m., which made it seem unlikely that Glazebrook was somewhere that morning. The boy's father told the judge that he saw him at home around 11 a.m. on the day the murder took place. Glazebrook helped him move his things to his new home in Carmel. Also, Glazebrook's parents said they did not see any cuts on their son's face that day, which would have been hours or days after the murder. Michelle Wilson was a witness who had already shown up, but the prosecution called her back because she was being aggressive. She said again that she had not told the cops anything about the conversation she had with Glazebrook, just like she did at the preliminary hearing. A doctor in the emergency room said that Glazebrook had received surgery for a scratch on his face the day after the murder, but the doctor did not think the scratch was from someone's nails. On other occasions, Glazebrook told police that he got the scratch when he touched a piece of plexiglass in the garden while working on a boat. In court, the owner of a bar said she saw a man. This person saw a guy who looked like Glazebrook in her bar on the Thursday before the murder. This man also had a scratch on his face. After a year, when the police called, she did not want to name any one person from the bar. She could only give a vague idea. Once again, this information brings up one of the main issues the lawyers had to deal with during the trial. It looks like the investigation may not have been 100% full. Police said they knew a lot more about the case after talking to witnesses than what they said in court. It is not the same because detectives threw away the written records they typed up and the defense asked to see the original records. The judge said that the person who threw away the records did not mean to, but the issues still remain. Police did not agree with Glazebrook's parents that no notes were taken during the conversations. Detectives may not have been able to remember everything that witnesses said, so there were gaps between what they wrote down and what witnesses said. Some witnesses also seemed to be changing what they said before. For example, an investigator used Glazebrook's scratch on the face and his nervousness during the interview as signs of doubt, even though these things were not written down by the investigator. In a different case, the investigator wrote in their notes that the bar owner could not definitely identify Glazebrook. However, the investigator explained that the bar owner could not identify Glazebrook. The case was not easy because they could not use the proof they got when they arrested someone without a warrant, and there were also questions about the investigation itself. The jury could not decide if the person was guilty or not, so there was a mystery. By a vote of 9-3, to three, they found the person not guilty. People who did not give up became important in future cases because of what they did. Researchers could not put Glazebrook in jail again, even if they had more information. The county attorney's office looked into the case again in 2020, so the detectives from the Monterey County Sheriff's Office decided to do the same. The Monterey County Sheriff's Department kept thinking about the case even after Glazebrook got away. In 1983, a hero said DNA testing was not available. Instead, blood typing was the only genetic way to figure out who someone was. In this case, the DNA data was very important. It was by far the strongest proof that Glazebrook was involved in the murder. On April 26, 2023, the judge was going to give Glazebrook his term. But the sad death of Michael Stone's wife, Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone, on October 15, 1981, has left him with deep mental scars that are hard to get over. Besides the pain of losing his wife, he had to deal with false claims that he had something to do with her death, even though the police had cleared him of any wrongdoing. Scientists have made progress in DNA technology, which gives Stone the chance to start healing. A close friend of Sonia's, Carolyn McBride, told the cops that Michael Stone was not fit to care for his daughter and that Sonia and Michael were no longer together. In May 1980, Dr. Milton Estes, Stone's daughter's family doctor, checked her out and talked to her. Even though Sonia's mother told him about her worries, Dr. S. decided there was no proof of any problems. Michael Stone finally got custody of his daughter back, but she moved to British Columbia, Canada, to live with a family member. 
15 year old Melissa Lee was murdered in April 1993 and a Bothell man was finally arrested yesterday. That's him. Is Melissa Lee. On April 13, 1993, darkness descended upon Melissa Lee's peaceful home in Bothell, Washington, turning it into a terrible night. She was only 15 years old and lived alone. She was excited to have a friend over for the night. It had been after 9.30 p.m. when she last called her mom. The call was just to make sure she was okay. They did not know that this would be the last time they saw Melissa in those safe walls. What could have gone wrong that night with Melissa Lee? What did she do in the dark hours that made her disappear? Bothell is a quiet neighborhood that is in between Seattle and Everett. It is also close to city services. The beautiful Pacific Northwest is a great place to live. It is known for having great schools, family-friendly neighborhoods, and beautiful parks. A lot of people in Bothell think it is a great place to live. The town likes to keep things small so that everyone feels like they belong. There is crime everywhere, but in Bothell, it is not as high as in bigger towns. This means the people who live there can have a safe and quiet place to live. She was born on February 2, 1978, and her life was full of hopes and dreams. Melissa had a beautiful charm that made people want to be with her when she was only 15. Mom said her daughter was beautiful, sweet, and always nice. She brought joy with her everywhere she went, and everyone she met will remember how lively she was. Eric, one of the brothers, was 19 years old, and the other was 13. She dreamed of being a model and seeing her unique beauty on magazine covers and on the stage. It made Melissa feel better to spend time with older people, help them, and make them laugh. It was easy for her to get along with others, which helped her make lasting friendships. People also praised her beauty and charm. Melissa Lee's mother worked as a bartender nearby that night, while Melissa Lee was home by herself. Melissa was excited to spend the night with a friend, but that friend never showed up. She was really excited for Melissa to see her. Her brothers also left the house as the night went on. Sharon Lee and her fiancé went home after midnight, but Melissa was not there. Sharon felt very worried as she looked at what she saw. The front door was open and the living room was a mess, so someone had broken in. The coffee table was in the wrong place and there were peanuts and ashtray all over the floor. The mess got even worse when a milk glass fell over. Leaves of strange things at the crime scene made it even stranger. It was clear that Melissa did not own the lighter or the cigarettes that did not look like Marlboro's. There was also a strong chemical smell in the air, which made Sharon feel even worse. In her heart, Sharon knew that something was very wrong. It could have been her gut feeling or the clear signs of chaos. She did not want to wait around for Melissa to come back, so she did something right away. She reported Melissa missing. As the day went on, the hopes of a safe meeting lost their shine. Police found Melissa Lee's body on April 14, 1993, around 3 p.m. People found her body in a small, rocky valley below the Edgewater Creek Bridge. The bridge is on Mukiltio Boulevard, which is on the western edge of Everett's city limits. People saw this terrifying scene when they thought of the happy, lively girl who had won their hearts. Melanie was upset about what had happened because of the clothes she wore. She was wearing black shorts, dark socks, and an orange and pink San Jose Sharks jacket when they found her. It was clear that she had been fighting because her clothes were all over the place, and the fact that she was barefoot made the smell even worse. It was said that Melissa was taken from her home in Bothell, which is in the 19,800 block of Philbert Road. Melissa had been brutally killed, and her body had been thrown away, where it fell more than 100 feet below the bridge. Police never stopped looking for justice after Melissa's sad death, and they looked at everything possible. The case was very hard, and the name of a person of interest was still unknown, even after all their hard work. A strange spot on Melissa's shirt caught the attention of the police and became a key piece of evidence in the case. Tests for drugs and alcohol also showed that Melissa did not have any alcohol or drugs left in her body. A colorless substance called ethyl ether has been used for a long time as an anesthetic and a strong drug. They also found small amounts of heptane which is a main ingredient in gasoline and has a strong smell. Family and friends were shocked and could not believe what they heard. It was hard for them to figure out what happened to Melissa. 
The cops looked into Melissa's personal life to try to figure out why she died in such a terrible way. Melissa had ties to some shady people, but she was known as a nice girl who had never been in trouble with the law. To begin with, police paid more attention to these friends because they were in gangs. But as the investigation went on, it became clear that none of these gang members were involved in Melissa's death. Cops looked into the case many times over the years, but there were no new clues and none of the gang members they were looking into were directly involved. Sharon Lee, Melissa's mother, said she never thought of these gang members as prospects. To her, they had always shown that they cared about Melissa, and seeing them at her funeral made her feel even closer to them. The story was even more interesting because of all the complicated relationships and possible reasons behind Melissa Lee's death. This made the cops even more determined to find the truth about her death. The police went through Melissa's things carefully and then looked at the book they found in her room. A big find that would have a huge effect on the case was waiting for her in the pages of her book. Lee's notebook also showed how hard things were for her after she broke up with someone. On April 12, 1993, she wrote on her last note, I hope to God we get back together. In her March 14, 1993 post, Melissa talked about meeting Alan for the first time. She had met him on the phone while watching Nightline. That is how Nightline was in the 1990s. Some people called it a date line or a party line. People who watched Nightline could call people in their area and talk. It might sound dangerous, like Tinder, since there were no pictures, so you did not really know the person you were talking to. But at that time, a lot of people in the area did it, and it was a good way to meet new people. Alan Dean was 35 years old when Melissa met him. After these telling journal entries made him famous, Alan Edward Dean was one of the first people thought to be involved in a crime. The strange facts and the link between Alan and Melissa were very important to the probe. Police had a great place to start looking into his past to see if he had anything to do with what happened that night. Police say they talked to a few men who they thought might have been involved with the 1993 case. To find out more, they put four people through polygraph tests. At the time, Brad Wolvatten was in charge of the case for the sheriff's office. He said that the rumors about these men did not seem to be real and that there was not any solid proof. At the start of the investigation on May 18, 1993, the police called the people Lee had written down in his address book. As one of the contacts, a guy named Dean was named with a different name. Nightline was also named. Officer Greg Renta from Snohomish County set up a meeting with Dean at an Everett apartment on Madison Street. The flat is about 3.5 miles from where the body was found. Dean told him that he knew Lee and that he and Lee had talked on the phone. Dean called the number under the name Mike. That they had been on a few dates did not mean they were getting sexual. Dean made it clear. Dean worked as a worker at the Everett plant for Boeing. He put together decorative walls next to Airport Road in the shop inside. Dean told the cops that he could not work for a few months because he hurt his back. The surgery to put pins in Dean's back took place on May 8, 1993. The police officer wrote this down. Some people also thought it was likely that Dean could have gotten different drugs at work. Dean told them that he changed his name when he talked to new people for the first time when they asked. That is not the only thing he might have lied about. Dean looked young, so someone in their early 20s might have thought he was younger than 35. The cops were suspicious from the start because of what Dean said. He said at first that he did not know Melissa had died, which did not make sense since they were close. She was killed and dumped only three miles from Dean's house, which made people wonder more. The fact that Dean was a mechanic also made it easy for him to get many drugs. Melissa's body showed signs of heptane, which is like gasoline. Over time, Melissa Lee's mother, Sharon Lee, made the tough choice to start over, even though she was still sad and wanted justice for her daughter's death. She had to think about the health of her other two children, Eric and Kelly, while she was sad. Because Sharon thought that the person who killed Melissa might hurt her other children, she was afraid for their safety. Because she thought the worry of what was going on in Washington was too much for her, she chose to move across the country to Tennessee. Sharon moved back to the area in 1994, though, because she wanted to help her daughter's case in any way she could. He told Sharon to save money and then offer a prize, put up ads, and hand out flyers in the area. 
The first prize was $10,000 for anyone with important information that could help make an arrest within three weeks. Of course, Sharon ran out of money over time, and she was mentally and emotionally worn out. She was sick and stressed out because she did not know what would happen to her daughter. She said that she was dying and going crazy because she did not know who killed her daughter. Persons knew about the murder and saw flyers about the prize, but in 1994, no big leads came up. Sharon conveyed her discomfort, stating that living with the unresolved matter felt like a constant presence in her daily life, both day and night. She expressed a desire for the apprehension of the responsible individual, emphasizing that it was crucial not only for Melissa's peace, but also for her own. Many hardworking individuals have devoted many years to guarantee that Melissa's case did not get confused. People who were locked up in the area were given King the Diamond's playing cards with her picture on them. The jail staff hoped that the prisoners would recognize the people or familiarities and come forward with any useful details. People have been giving out playing cards with crimes on them since the 1970s. Genetic evidence was what finally ended Melissa's case. Police tried more than once to match the DNA found on Melissa's underwear as DNA testing got better. They looked for a long time but could not find a good match in their files. A well-known researcher called Cece Moore helped make a full DNA profile of the man who had just been named. Cece Moore became popular for her ABC show, The Genetic Detective, which she held after years of hard work to solve cold cases. She used what she knew to add the man's DNA to GDMatch, a public family database, at the end of 2018. Then Cece Moore carefully made a very long family tree using the DNA. She looked for the point where two branches met to find the man's parents. The study found two very good matches and three possibly good matches during this process. Also, there were a lot of games that were farther away. Officers chose Alan Dean's name from the list. In July 2019, they got DNA samples from Alan Dean to compare with DNA found at the crime scene. When three police officers dressed as someone else went to Alan Dean's house in July 2019, they had a good plan. A fake group of people told him they were gum testers and wanted to know what he thought about new kinds of gum. So they could get a piece of his DNA they wanted to spit out while he chewed. When the woman said she was taking Dean's DNA, Dean became suspicious right away. As written in Wolvan's report, Dean asked, You are not here to collect my DNA, right? This sudden change of plans messed up their first plan, so the cops knew they had to find another way to get his DNA. They decided to start spying on Mr. Dean in April 2020, which was a long time after the fact. But they did not like that he rarely left the house, which made it hard to find out important things. Things got better when he finally left his house to smoke a cigarette, even though it took a while. Because they wanted to test it, the cops quickly picked up the dropped cigarette and took it to the lab. They were amazed to find that the DNA from the cigarette was a perfect match to the DNA they already had on file. The results confirmed what they already thought and showed that he was the suspect. It was strange that they had been aware of him since the start of the murder case. Alan Dean was in Bothell, Washington, around 5 p.m. on June 2, 2023. They said Dean abused a girl in Scottsdale, Arizona, eight years before they said he killed Melissa Lee. The girl's name is not yet on the police record because it is a private matter. She talked about how Dean gave her drugs and alcohol which she used. At first, she did not think the weed was marijuana because she was getting very high. After getting drunk, Dean told her to take off her clothes, which she did. After that, she finally fell asleep. She had no idea how long her sleep would last. They find out they are at a very different age when they wake up. Dean told the police that he did give the girl beer and pot, but he said that it never turned sexual, just like with Melissa. He was caught and then freed, even though he was not charged. This made him move to a different state. It is important to remember that Dean has been caught many times for things like having marijuana on him, hitting his partner, resisting arrest, disobeying the police, and helping a child get into trouble. He had a bad reputation, but the cops never put his DNA in their database because they had never charged him with a crime. The fact that he had to post a huge $2 million bail to get out of jail makes it very possible that he was there. Even though he was in jail, he made it clear that he did not want to be in court the whole time. However, his message was hard to understand and had many things that did not make sense. 
He would not do what the court told him to do and used complicated legal terms that made everyone in the room lose their bearings. The way he acted and what he said made a lot of people in the courtroom just want him to stop talking. Sharon Lee took a plane to Washington, D.C. for a news conference. A picture of her daughter was next to her. During the event in court, she said something short but strong about how glad she was to see this long-awaited progress. It was clear that she was fine with what took place. Detective Wolvan, who was working on the case, said that big steps forward in technology were key to solving it. Furthermore, he talked to criminals who got away with their crimes and stressed that the police work hard with facts to make sure responsible and will never give up on their pursuit of justice. Gary Lee Haney On January 3, 1979, a young guy went to the mouth of the Snohomish River. It looked like something was caught in the fishing line when he found something strange. He was scared to see that it was human bones as he got closer to the strange thing. Soon after, he called the police. As soon as they arrived, they began an investigation that would last for over 40 years. Who this person was and how they died were the most important things to know. Snohomish County, Washington is a lovely spot in the middle of the Northwest. It is famous for its cute towns and long past. There are lots of ancient sites that tell stories about the past and fun things to do for people who like to take risks. Everyone is always happy to see you and ready to smile, just like your grandmother's apple pie. For a town where everyone knows each other's names, the crime rate is amazingly low. There you would not have to worry about leaving your doors open. The strange bones found in Snohomish County in January 1979 caused a lot of trouble in a place that was usually quiet. It was still cold in the county on January 3, 1979, which was the third day of the year. A man from the area, whose daily job was mostly to shoot ducks, decided to begin his favorite activity on the western side of North Spencer Island. He saw something different from the usual beautiful view as he got closer to the mouth of the Snohomish River. He found bones of people in the reeds and rocks, which did not belong there. Pale bones of people who died too soon tell stories of their lives. The police rushed to the scene near Everett, Washington because of the unsettling find. The duck shooter had found something that made it clear that this was not going to be easy. It was terrible for everyone. Everyone was shocked and interested by the scary findings that happened all over the country. The investigation was about to begin. It was nothing like having a warm cup of coffee in the morning to find the bones near Everett, Washington. When the police arrived, not even they could hide the chills that came from the hard reality of their surroundings. The duck hunter was still shocked, so he showed the police the body parts. There was a football shoe and a piece of leg bone in the fishing line, looking like a creepy still life. The hunter for ducks helped the police move west a bit. The scene began to take shape. A shirt with red, orange, white, and gray checks that looked strangely like a head, ribs, and a shoe a shoe that for some reason still had a foot in it. The officers found some strange things when they looked at the scary scene again. There was nothing in the leather wallet that could help them figure out who this person was. There was no money, driver's license, fishing ticket, or anything else that would have been useful. They came across a size 33 to 43 belt that was just sitting there like an old scrap of paper. There was a pair of shoes with laces and two strange numbers on them, 30 and 38. The scary prize hunt kept going. The name O'Sullivan, written on the rubber shoes, was one of the few clues they had. On the tag of a pair of green pants, it said with pride that they were iron-free and made in the USA. Even though most people might not think this is important, it was a huge deal for the police. They believed that learning about the place where these were made and sold would assist them in locating their target. There were creepy hints, but the mystery grew. We did not learn much about what happened to the poor man from the bones. It got harder and harder to find even the most basic answers as the process went on. The broken body parts were given to a medical officer so that a pathologist could look at them. The sections of the body were from a man who had been dead for a few months. The doctor saw that with great care. It was not the most exciting find, but it was the only one that could be made because the body was so badly damaged. No matter how hard the cops tried, they could not come up with a name for the murder scene. Robert Phillips was the police chief for Snohomish County at the time. At the bottom of the card, 
It said John Doe 791 and said that the cause of death was indeterminate because there were no signs. The unknown guy was finally buried at Everett Cypress Memorial Park on March 15, 1979 after being in the ground for days, weeks, and months. So long as no one claimed him or could finally identify him, he would stay there. Soon, the harsh truth came out. Leads were drying up faster than water in a desert. The spies had to finally face the harsh truth. The case was over. The search for John Doe's body parts was not over yet. It was almost 30 years before the case went any further. Science and police tools from today saved the day when we least expected them to. They were given new ways to do things, which gave the police hope that John Doe 791 could finally be found. In 2008, Detective Jim Scharf and former Judge Ken Costard decided to review a number of old, unsolved cases. The 1979 John Doe case came back to life like a bird from the ashes. People did not want to deal with the mystery of the unknown man. Not being able to find many tips was a harsh reminder of lost important proof. They were still determined, so they kept looking for the truth by going through old pictures and papers. There was still time for our brave spies to try to figure out what was going on. There have been a lot of John and Jane to since then, which makes things even cloudier. To keep things straight, they gave their 1979 John Doe a new name, Spencer Island John Doe. The cops were able to find Spencer Island John Doe's body in 2015. A forensic dentist named Dr. Kyle Tanaka hoped that a close look at the tooth records would bring up some lost clues. The road, though, stayed dark. They did not give up, though. They kept looking for a tasty piece of truth and added information about the case to the National Database of Missing Persons. Long lost clothes and the dead person's personal items were among the things they looked through. There was nothing, though. Then, by chance, in late 2015, a shocking tip came in on a sunny day like lightning. The tip said that Spencer Allen looked a lot like a farmhand from Marysville who had been missing for a long time. The cops went on the hunt because they like a good story. Someone from Marysville who worked on an Amazon farm was not like any other person. In the area, he was well known for having a fruit stand and riding his bike around. Because he walked funny, it was hard to forget him. His last known location was in the 1970s, and the information seemed to be correct. Our employees used BillyOnGraves.com to find a tombstone in Yuma, Arizona, after looking for it for a month. The worker on the farm had been taking a break in the southwestern desert since 1981. This finding made the detectives doubt their ongoing investigation, which was not what they expected at first. Needless to say, this is not the end of our story. The unburied bodies gave Dr. Kathy Taylor of the King County Medical Examiner's Office some interesting information. John Doe could have been a guy between the ages of 27 and 61 and he could have been between 5 feet 1 inch and 5 feet 7 inches tall. It was not clear what race he was. He could have been Native American, white, or a mix of the two. It became clear that this secret man's life was full of contradictions as more pieces of the puzzle fit together. His broken femur seemed to have healed on its own, but for some reason he had been to the dentist, and now there were metal fillings in some of his teeth, and big holes in his jawbone had closed up. After trying a lot of different things and coming up with nothing, detectives turned to the art of forensic drawing. Natalie Murray, an artist, stepped up. She was right when she said that the drawing did look like it was of a person who was half Native American and half white. The sketch helped police figure out who Spencer Island John Doe might be, but it did not give them the whole story yet. Ultram Labs, a private Texas company, got a piece of John Doe's leg in 2021. A company called Nusolves.com paid for this job. To get DNA from the samples, they used cutting-edge technology and years of experience. This gave the cops another clue to look into. Our officers finally found a woman whose DNA matched that of the victim after a lot of hard work. They told her they had been looking for her half-brother for decades but had not found him. In March 2023, Offram finally told everyone who the long-lost brother was after 44 years of pain. John Doe from Spencer Island was Gary Lee Haney. A big event took place at Kansas' busy Topeka Hospital on September 23, 1950. They are a lively little boy born to Bernice Helen Schaefer and Joseph Dominique Condomini. Gary Lee Haney was his name, and soon a lot of people would say it. 
but things in Topeka were not very good. Gary and Mary went their separate ways before he could even talk. The boy's life was changing, but things were about to get better. Bernice wore white again when she married Sheldon Lee Haney in 1955. Sheldon did not just marry Bernice, he also took in her son and changed his name to Gary Lee Haney. After that, the family quickly moved to New York, where Gary grew up. Gary's real father died when he was 16 and his mother died when he was 19. Since then, Gary has been living with Sheldon. When Hall was younger, someone told him that Gary's brain was weird in a way that made people look at him funny. People paid attention to him because he was different. He quit the army right away and went to work for the Air Force. He took his family from the busy streets of New York to Kansas' beautiful wheat fields. Gary missed a lot of holiday dinners because the trip was too far. He spent less and less time with his family over time, and he almost never showed up in family photos. Hall, on the other hand, said they never really talked to Gary about anything. The mystery surrounding Gary seemed to be stumping people more than a bad case of chicken pox. Sad to say, Sheldon died in Oregon in 1997, which made people wonder more. When it came out that he had been lying about Gary going missing, it made things even stranger. It is interesting that Gary had been declared dead for three years before his body was found on Spencer Island. The autopsy showed that he had not been living for months, but no one could figure out what happened to him for three years. His death was the subject of many ideas, ranging from rock falls to strange health problems, but no one could prove any of them. The police thought that Gary and his stepfather Sheldon shared a home in Everett. Sheldon was a snowbird because he liked to travel and spent the winters in Baja, California. In the middle of the 1980s, Sheldon moved to Texas and never talked about Gary. He later moved to Oregon, and his silence about Gary's departure before his death in 1997 made things even more mysterious. As Gary's life story came to an end, his family's mixed feelings came out, and they mourned again. They were now ready to go. When they finally solved the case, the detectives let out a sigh of relief. Destiny Pittman On February 7, 2013, someone shot and killed 21-year-old Destiny Pittman in her home on James Drive in Kokomo, Indiana. For some reason, the case went cold, and there were no suspects to keep it going. But now there is a new event that has made people pay attention to the problem again. An unsolved case that went on for 10 years and a long-awaited result are all part of this scary story. What went wrong? How did Destiny die? Was this brutal act premeditated, or did it happen by chance? There is 9% less crime in Kokomo than in the rest of the country, which makes people think it is a good place to live. There are also parks and old places that many people love about the city. Kokomo is in the middle of James Drive. This close-knit area is known for having nice people who laugh together. The murder of Destiny and the scary break-in broke the peace that used to be in this small town. Carla McCombs and Melvin Douglas Jr. gave birth to Destiny Renee Pittman on January 9, 1992. They loved her very much. She was always happy, so everyone else was happy too. She aimed to turn into a model and subsequently have a good life. Her friends and family said she was pretty, nice, and full of life. Destiny Pittman was about to start a great life when she graduated from high school. She was 21 years old at the time. She was excited to begin her path to change her life and become a model. Destiny was ready to settle down and pay off the house she had just bought to show how free and clear her mind she was. She loved living with her boyfriend, her roommate, and her roommate's two kids. The three dogs she had, two pit bulls and a chihuahua, were more than just pets, according to her mom. Destiny, her family, and her friends had no idea that something so terrible would happen to them and throw their lives into chaos. Things that happened before the terrible things seemed normal. Destiny was at home with her boyfriend, her neighbor, and their two kids on the evening of February 7, 2013. Two people came up to their house out of the blue. There was a loud banging on the door around 9.25 p.m. As soon as Pittman opened it, people heard loud shots and a big boom. Right then, confusion broke out and the sound of a gunshot shook the whole house. The bullet that hit Destiny in the chest killed the bright spirit that made life better for everyone. Someone fired a gun which scared people in the area enough to call for help. 
While Destiny was hiding with her two kids, her roommate called the cops very quickly. Destiny's death was shocking to the close-knit community when they learned about it. Police arrived at the crime scene on James Drive around 9.40, not long after getting the 911 call. The person who found Destiny saw her lying in the hallway with a gunshot wound to the chest. The bullet went through her and the wall of the hallway. Her boyfriend and roommate began to talk about what happened during the event because they felt terrible about losing such a lively and loving young woman. They'd also said that they hid with the kids when Pittman came up to the intruders. Police found a .40 caliber gun barrel and a bullet wound in the victim's chest at the crime scene. At first, they thought it was a home invasion. From what witnesses said, two armed people broke into the house to steal cash before Pittman attacked them. The police at first thought it was just a chance event. They were African American, the roommate told the police because of the way they spoke and the tone of their voice. Because they were looking into something, the police asked Destiny's boyfriend more questions, and he finally said something shocking. He had been in the weed business with Destiny. She quit the business anyway, though, because she got a big gift just a few days before the thieves broke into their house. He changed his mind and moved more than $2,000 in the bag of weed. The cops now have a theory. The thieves may have gone after the two people because they had drugs and cash on them. They looked for any connections or people who might have known about Destiny and her boyfriend's illegal activities. This became the major focus of their investigation. The police in Kokoma worked very hard, but they could not find much evidence that connected any of the suspects to the crime. People stole drugs and money in the first theft, which helped the police figure out what happened but did not give them any good leads or proof to back up their claims. Detectives did not have many options because there were no witnesses or physical clues that would have helped them find the criminals. Another person who was worried was Kokomo Police Captain Teresa Galloway. She said that people have not been telling the truth about the case. After about two years, everyone knew that Destiny's roommate and her boyfriend were helping the cops by giving them all the information they needed. The case went cold in the end, though. Dreams of making progress grew over time. The cops got more and angrier over this, and Destiny Pittman's family and friends were still struggling to deal with the tragedy and the questions that they still did not have answers to. Carla Pittman McCombs did not give up hope and wished for justice for her daughter. The small bit of hope started to fade, though, as time went on. She cried out, nothing seems right. As the Pittman family, friends, and loved ones grieved and wished for peace, people in the neighborhood helped them. Numerous people, including Destiny's close friend Kelsey Crow, wanted that the person who did it would feel so bad about it that they would finally find the courage to tell someone. But as the weeks and months went by, there was almost no more hope. In addition to his own issues, Destiny's dad, Junior Douglas, was upset that the case was not going forward. Douglas held on to a glimmer of hope, even though he was having a hard time and his confidence was dropping. He told the people who were guilty to come forward because they would not want their own children to go through what they were going through. Although it had been almost 10 years since Destiny Pittman's death, no one had solved the case. Her family, friends, and the whole town of Kokomo had trouble with it. Hope started to fade over time, and leads that were once hot became cold. But spies worked hard behind the scenes to bring Destiny Justice back to life. In December 2022, an almost impossible phone call was the first sign of hope. Someone who had read the news stories for years felt like they needed to say something. They believed a drug deal was the reason for the break-in that killed Destiny. The case came to life with this new information, which also created a key lead that had not been there for a while. The suspects were two brothers named Joey and Jesse McCartney. Someone came to their house in his white Jeep Cherokee and picked them up. Someone put on black leather gloves and walked up to Pitton's front door with a gun while telling the other person to stay in the car. After he joined, Joey went inside with his brother. While still in the car, the person heard a loud boom. After that, both brothers ran out of the house. When they got back in the car, they were both happy because they had won a lot of money. Many years went by before anyone said who made the call. It was a woman who knew the suspects from before. She told the truth because the case made her feel bad and hurt. The person also said that Jesse had sold the tools he used to break in and the car he used to get away. Soon after the crime, the Kokomo Police Department finally got orders to arrest Joey 
and Jesse McCartney. Just as more proof and witness accounts came in the case for Destiny Pittman, which at first looked hopeless, gained new momentum. The boys were each charged with murder breaking and entering with the intent to hurt someone and planning to break and enter. They were all also charged with breaking and entering after dark. Court papers make these charges available to everyone. Records from the court show that Jesse was charged with a class of felony for robbery that caused physical hurt. The charges also included having cocaine and marijuana on him. The day of judgment for those who killed Destiny Pittman came quickly after March 1, 2023, when the woman came back. Early this morning, police nabbed Joey McCartney at his home in Grand, Kentucky. After two hours, they caught Jess McCartney at his Kokomo house. After years of being in pain and fear, the McCartney brothers had to take responsibility for the terrible things they did while they were in jail. Destiny's family finally felt better when they found out that justice was close by. The Pittman family got help from the cops in Kokomo as they went through the court system. The unsolved death had made people in the town angry in the past. Now, everyone was excited for the hearing and what was going to happen next. The hearing and court process for the murder of Destiny Pittman was the next big step toward justice. Both Jess McCartney and Joey McCartney went through their first hard times. Jess McCartney went to court on March 9, 2023, and said he was not guilty. The case was still going on. After that, the judge told the cops to keep him in jail without bond. On March 10th, Joey McCartney went to court for the first time. The judge wrote down that he was not guilty. He also got jail time without a bond. Since the hearing did not start until August 2023, the prosecutors had a lot of time to make their case. The arrest of Joey and Jess McCartney brought a strange kind of peace to Destiny Pittman's family, who were very sad. After years of pain and unsolved questions, hearing about the arrest made a lot of people feel a lot of different things. The arrest did not bring their loved one back, but it did make things right and give them a moment of sadness, relief, and new hope. Christina Castiglion on March 19, 1983, Christina Castiglione disappeared on a cold night in Livingston County, Michigan. It is hard to follow this story because it seems very strange. After 10 days of not being seen, her body was found in a wild area far from her home. Forty years passed with no news about the case. Later, progress in DNA technology let a big change take place. After 40 years, the crime was still undiscovered, leaving her family and friends with many questions. What kind of hateful person could have done something like that? Why did justice seem to get away from this broken family for so long? Livingston County is a beautiful place. Around 196,000 people live in this 585 square mile county. There are both city and country parts to this busy town. It is beautiful, and there are lots of fun things to do outside, like hiking, camping, and swimming. The accident took place in this peaceful area, which was sad. It left a mystery that would worry people in the area for years. The daughter of Chris and Beatrice Castellione was born on March 8, 1964. Her name is Christina Lynn Castellione, Anna Christina's older sister, and she grew up in Redford, Michigan. Their home was full of happiness and peace. Christina played sports like basketball and volleyball after she finished from Redford Union High School to show how good she was at them. She often chose to work alone instead of going out with other people, which made people think she was shy and thought a lot about herself. Christina's honest and kind nature, on the other hand, won over everyone and made an impression on both friends and strangers that will last. She was hopeful at the start of 1983. She also had a new job as a study clerk at the Detroit Edison Company, which she liked. Christina was excited about the idea of going on a new trip after high school, and she thought about joining the army and leaving her home. Ready to join the army, she talked to a recruiter. It was a brave move that led to the future she wanted. She had no idea that her hopes for a happy life and lots of chances would be sadly dashed, leaving her family and friends to deal with the painful loss. The night of Saturday, March 19, 1983, experienced extremely low temperatures. Chris Lindsay, Christina's boyfriend, asked her not to work today so she could do some housework and hang out with him. Around noon, they said goodbye and agreed to meet up again that night. It never worked out for them to go on a date. Around 2 o'clock p.m., 
she went back to her parents' house on La Carfa Road and took a nap. The girl's mom said she was thrilled about going out with her boyfriend that night. Not hearing from him by 7.30 p.m., though, made her antsy, so she set out to find him. She started by going to her boyfriend's house. His sister told her that he was not there when she got there. After that, she went to a friend's house a mile down Five Mile Road. Her partner was not at her friend's house either. Katie hung out with her friend for a while and watched TV with her before going home. She walked everywhere because she sold her favorite red Mustang a week ago because the insurance was too expensive. She never came back, which is sad. Things got worse for Christina's parents when they tried to call her the next day but couldn't. Beatrice, Christina's mother, called the Redford Police Department around noon on March 21, 1983 to say that her daughter was missing. She had tried every way to get in touch with her but failed. The cops began a full search right away after Christina's mother called them. To try to figure out what happened before she went missing, police talked to her family, friends, and other people they knew. Chris's boyfriend told the cops that on March 19, 1983, at 7.30 p.m., he saw her standing outside of the Kingsborough Party Store on the Five Mile Wayside in Redford Township. He was not going to stop and pick her up because he knew Christina did not like the people he was with. Christopher stopped the car a short distance from the store and got out to wait for Christina to come by. When she did not show up, he went to look for her and said he had been looking for her for a long time. He tried to call her house because he was afraid for her safety, but no one answered. He was worried about Christina's parents, but he did not tell them because he did not want to make them mad. The police talked to a lot of people and put out pictures of the missing girl to find out more. Penny Mares, who says she is psychic, finally gave them a clue. Christina's body could be in the trash in Inkster. The cops carefully searched the trash cans and trash around the area, but they did not find anything. Some people did not like that the police used a psychic assistant, but Detective John Crete supported it and said it showed how dedicated they were to following every lead in their case. The police and the people who lived in Redford were both left with questions as the search for Christina went beyond the city's borders. He said he found dead bodies while shooting deer in the Oak Grove State Game Area in Deerfield Township, which is more than 45 miles from her town. He said it had been unbearably long days of looking before he found them. Soon after, police from Redford went to the spot to look into what happened. In the bush where Fawcett and Fisher Roads meet, they found the body half buried in the ground. The cops say that the body is that of 19-year-old Christina. When police arrived at the spot, they saw that Christina's body had been buried in the woods before it snowed. The snow showed her body when it began to melt. Someone found her near a group of trees. There was a few inches of snow on some of her. There will be an autopsy on the body. What they found shocked everyone. Christina got hurt and then could not breathe, dying. There was also DNA from a man on her that no one had ever seen before. For some, this gave them hope that new DNA technology could help them catch the killer. At first, the police were following Christina's boyfriend and his friends around. But when they could not find any proof that they were involved in the crime, they were finally let go. Instead, the evidence showed that Christina had been picked up by someone she did not know, who then did the horrible thing. There were not many violent crimes in Livingston County, but there was a strange trend that kept happening. Between 1978 and 1983, ten bodies were found on state-owned land in the county. This made people think that there might be a serial killer in the area. People also thought the man who discovered Christina's body was guilty. The lie detector test did not happen, and he kept telling different stories. But there was no strong proof that he did it, and he had never been in trouble with the law before. There was no arrest for the man because of this. It got harder for the police to find the person who killed Christina even with these clues. They ran out of new ways to look for them. The scary thought that the criminal was still out there made people in Livingston County feel very bad. As less news about the case came out, it slowly disappeared from the front pages. The case was over in the end. When DNA Tech came out in 2000, things seemed like they could get better. Based on what they learned at the crime scene, detectives were able to do a DNA test on a man. They put the DNA profile into CODIS, the country's criminal justice database, to see if it produced any matches that would help them find the killer. They looked for something but could not find it no matter how hard they tried. 
the case stopped being active. Kristina's parents did not let the memory of their beloved daughter fade, even though things went badly. Instead, they clung to the hope that in the end, justice would win. They were even more driven as the years went by, and they wanted the case to end in some way. No one knew anything about the case for 20 years, but after this, there was another sign of hope in 2022. The Livingston County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Squad set out to solve this case with a group of veterans. After asking for money, they used the 1983 DNA samples from people they thought were suspicious to do more in-depth DNA tests. That is because the season of justice helped them get the money they needed. This is a good nonprofit that pays for DNA tests on closed cold cases. Season of Justice gives money to police stations all over the country so they can test new technologies. When the body of the victim or the criminal is still missing and DNA testing is the only way to figure out who did it, this helps with the investigation of killings, assaults, and other crimes. The DNA samples were sent to Offram Incorporated, a well-known forensic lab in Texas that has solved many unsolved crimes in the past. This was done after they were given permission and pay. Researchers in Ulthram used DNA from the suspect, who has not been named, and a forensic-grade genome sequencing method to make a full genealogy picture. On family tree websites and genealogical records, they looked for people who fit the description and found a strong suspect. Three tests that compare DNA from members of the same family showed that the suspect was who they said they were. Finally figuring out that the mysterious male suspect was actually Charles David Shaw, put an end to the long-running case. The police carefully tracked down the suspect's family tree by using DNA genealogy sources to find single matches. In the end, this led them to the suspect's real uncle. Then they made a family tree by following the links back to Charles Shaw. When the truth came out in 2023, there was finally a win. The never-ending job of investigators showed that Charles David Shaw killed Christina Castilian. We do not know much about Shaw's early life, but what his family and the Livingston County Sheriff's Office said was scary. Some people said that Charles Shaw was an addict to sex and had issues with his mental health and his sense of who he was as a man. Shaw and the police had always had a problem. When the Livonia Police Department first caught him, it was in 1973 for breaking and entering. Then, in 1977, he was thought to be getting drugs. Trying to take a woman hostage in the Fowlerville McDonald's parking lot in 1981 got him caught. For this crime, he got two weeks in jail and had to go on probation. Taking women's shoes from a Kmart in 1982 got him arrested for the second time. They could not find any ties between Christina and Shaw that would have made them want to go after her. But they found that Shaw had been living in Livonia for a while before the murder and was only five kilometers away from where Christina went missing. It turned out that he had a hard personal life with drug and mental health issues that seemed to be connected to his illegal behavior. These new facts showed that Charles Shaw was an unhappy and complicated person who battled inner demons while doing terrible things. Sixteen months after Christina's death, Shaw accidentally choked to death, according to detectives. He had been 26 years old. Being unable to bring him to justice was a sad thing. Police Chief Mike Murphy of Livingston County thanked the Shaw family for their help with the case at a news conference in February 2023. It was very important for everyone to work together to find out that Charles Shaw killed Christina. Before Shaw died, his wife told the cops important things about him. She told him that he wanted to change his gender and needed help doing it. She also said he was a thief, which added to the mystery of Shaw's past. Christine's sister, Anna Castelloni, who is the only family member still alive, showed how happy she was that the case was over. Anna never gave up trying to get people to notice the trouble. She even told the news about her sister in 2014. Every day, she said, she thought about her. Anna felt relieved when she finally found Christina's killer after 40 years of guessing. Genome sequencing and genetic background that are good enough to use in court were what made the case go away. It made Sergeant Matt Young of the Livingston County Sheriff's Office very happy that they had found the killer of a person 40 years ago. Police now hope that genetic DNA results will help other families of violent crime victims find peace. What are your thoughts about these cases? Let us know in the comment section below. 
Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for such more stories. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.